Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's podcast is near and dear and personal <laughs> to my heart. And before I, I introduce today's guest, I know everybody's like, is, is Mark bringing on like one of his family members? Better. Better than a family member. <laughs> but before I, I reveal why this is such a personal podcast for me and so near and dear to my heart, I would be remiss if I did not properly introduce my co-host, Six Sigma. You know him. You love him. The smartest guy in the room, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, postingdomination.com forward slash Langy. Today's podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash land geek in this time that i just did that little intro i just posted 124 listings on craigslist so boom that, that. that might be a little aggressive more like, uh-huh. in, the, in the short time you did the intro but i will tell you it's amazing to me how craigslist is still making the phones ring um when in fact you know other people are looking at other platforms craigslist is non-stop traffic baby I know, I know it. So let's talk about today's guest, shall we? Now, you, you know, I, I think we have to, right? We, like, ha- we have to talk about today's guest. I'm excited. I, and this is, this is really, a lot of people think this is a boring topic, right? Like, I mean, I went to school for this for four years and, you know, okay, I got to admit, it's kind, of a, it's kind of boring, but it's exciting and I'm excited to talk to Well, I, I'm excited about it because everybody always asks me, Mark, should I do an S Corp? Should I do a C Corp? And, you know, an LLC? You know, they ask me about tax issues and I always say the same damn thing. I'm not a CPA and I can't give tax advice, but you know who is? Jim Atkinson. Yeah, there you go. From AtkinsonCPA.com, <laughs> my personal CPA. No longer do I need to speak for him. He can speak for himself. Jim Atkinson, how are you? I'm doing well. I feel uh, this is like uh, quite the intro. I've never had, I feel like I should be like busting through a, uh, a tarp or something. Uh, uh, this is quite the intro. No, it's fantastic. And, and the reason uh, it's so personal to me is, you know, here's a guy that saves me money on taxes, guides me financially, and keeps me out of a lot of trouble. So, you know, he's like family. Um, but this is a really complicated topic. I mean, Scott Todd, you know, we get questions all the time. And the three of us are doing a very simple Mike McCallowitz system called Profit First. So Jim, can you kind of uh, rewind the tape for us and kind of give us a little bit about your background and then why, why you like Profit First? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, I've been practicing accounting for a, oh, well, over 20 years now. Um, I've had my own firm for um, just around that and working with small businesses and individuals, helping them uh, maximize tax savings and uh, handle their <clears throat> their financials. And uh, you want me to talk about profit first? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, yeah, sure. Okay. And so uh, profit first is something that I, I became aware of maybe – uh, two years ago. Um, it was a book by Mike Michalowicz. I read it, was inter- inter- instantly interested in the approach because one of the most common problems I have, I, I work with a lot of people that that want financial statements done, prepared for their business, but they don't ever really use them. Um, they don't use it to manage their <clears throat> manage their company. Um, what they really want, want to know and the most important thing for the business owner is, you know, how much cash do I have to spend? What do I, what can I pay myself? Where does all the money go? Um, all these different questions that profit first is basically a system that creates a force discipline on uh, making sure you, uh, you pay yourself first, essentially. And, and I think we all, all three have talked before about using it and it's a very effective way to make sure you keep money in your company. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really been phenomenal for me because I'm, I, I really would do what Mike McAllister would talk about in the book, which was, sort of, you know, bank balance accounting. I just look at my bank account and then feel good or feel bad, right? Depending on the, the ebbs and flows of that account where now there's like a built-in discipline to it 
where there's money that goes off to profit. There's money that goes off to taxes. I never have to worry about, will there be enough money for taxes? It automatically flows from there. And most importantly is I'm assured a profit. Uh, for you, Scott Todd, you've got, a, you've got a, an accounting background. How's it helped you? Well, look, this is a capital intensive business that we run, right? Like we, we can't go buy land without capital. And so part of the challenge that I had as I transitioned from, you know, an employee to a full-time investor is, man, how do I keep the cash flow uh, flowing? How do I, how do I keep the, the cash in the business so that, um, you know, I could continue to buy properties while still living, right? Because I got to pay myself. And uh, so when I started looking at the profit first plan, I realized, okay, this is a way of doing that. But I think I even do it a little bit different than you do, Mark. So I, I do a modified plan, a modified profit first. And what that means to me is that, um, and I know this is a, is a plan that's kind of supported by the profit first system, but what it does is I take out 30% you know, as the money hits my account, I take out 30% towards land. So that money remains in, in my account so I can go buy more land. Cause it, look, it runs us about 30%, right? On average, it's about 30%. So whatever hits my account, I take 30% of that and that's my land money. And then after that, I follow all of the formulas in terms of profit comes out next, then my salary, then uh, the, the balance is operating expenses. And it's amazing because when you do that, it really does line up and you're forcing the profit, you're forcing the expenses, you're forcing everything that you need to, to, to back into the formulas. Yeah, it's great, it's great. So Jim, you know, when, when you get a new client, what are the typical questions that, that you, you see are the typical sort of mistakes that people make and how can we avoid them? Well, well let me mention first, one of my biggest questions I get, and you, you kind of alluded to it at the beginning, is about what entity type. So that's a huge one because, um, you know, the, the age old qu answer to that question is, well, it depends. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, the proper entity is different in almost every circumstance, but I want to, I want to dispel some myths here. One of the things people, uh, people often come in and say is, um, you know, I need you to help me with my business taxes. And I'll say, okay, what kind of, uh, of, of entity do you have set up? Do you have an S corp, a partnership or sole proprietorship? They're going to be like, uh, oh, I have an LLC. Well, you know, an LLC, and this is a common misconception, it's not even recognized by the IRS. It's a, what's called a disregarded entity. And you get to choose as an LLC owner, or, or actually LLC owners are called members. An LLC member can choose what type of tax status they have. So if you're a multi-member LLC, you can be a partnership, a corporation, or an S corporation. If you're a single, single member LLC, you can be a sole proprietor, or an S corporation, or a C corporation. So you have all those choices. Now- <clears throat> From a tax standpoint, how are they taxed differently? So sole proprietor is uh, most often the, this is, this is the most simplistic form of business to run. There's less complications. There's less uh, headaches as far as record keeping. And then you can still have the limited liability if you um, have an LLC, um, you know, running as, an, as your sole proprietorship. However, from a tax perspective, um, it's the worst because you pay self-employment tax on 100% of the net profit. So essentially, that's roughly 15.3% extra tax on top of your income tax. So uh, there, you have a small business, but once you start making, I usually tell clients when your profit is going to be north of thirty to $40,000, you definitely want to look at um, other, other structures. Now, uh, S Corp is, now this is depending on the type of industry, but an S Corp is typically the most favorable from a tax perspective. But if you're buying and pr selling property, it's not necessarily the best, but the way that you buy and sell property with your installment sales, um, it actually works out okay. And that's a whole long rabbit trail we could get into about ta taxes and accounting that would make your listeners drive off the road, <laughs> but um, 
the, the reason that S Corp is typically a better tax, uh, you know, tax type is because you get the, the combination of uh, being able to take distributions and salary and you're only paying payroll tax on a fraction of the income, whereas a sole proprietorship, you're paying on 100% of the profit. And partnerships are the same way as a sole proprietorship. But um, the reason a lot of people choose partnerships is there's a lot of flexibility and how you can move money around, um, to put it in simple terms. So, so if I have an LLC set up and I'm like, hey, I'm going to tax myself as a sole proprietor and then I cross that thirty to 40000 threshold, can I change? Can I say now I want to be taxed as a S corp? Absolutely. And in fact, the IRS, they want you to change. They want you to make the election right when you start the company, but they give you a, a, a – they've made it really easy to change retroactive. In fact, you can make the change um, – I will. Ha I have several clients that we will make an election to be an S corp for 2016, as long as we do it before March of 2017. So, it's a it's a pretty good situation. Um, now it's uh, the IRS. They, they never turn. They never. At least I've never had one rejected uh, for a, a late election. But uh, technically, you're supposed to do it. I think within 90 days of uh, establishing the company, but nobody ever does. I always put there's an excuse, uh, and no offense to any attorneys out there, but I always put as my reason for for filing late is the attorney failed to uh, file pr properly, <laughs> timely file the uh, the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Hey, that's, great. <laughs> that's hilarious. Just throw the attorneys under the bus. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's always a good day when you can blame an attorney, right? J Jim just ran over all the attorneys. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, Jim, you're, you're a geek like, like us. And uh, I know that you're into systems and processes and automation. If, as, as a client, what kinds of systems and processes and automation should a – uh, a new client have coming in that's going to make your life easier and their life easier. Is there anything you'd recommend? Well, one of the things, and uh, you introduced me to it, and I use it every day now, uh, Basecamp is a very good way to exchange, uh, um, you know, documents. And especially when you're just getting started with the, working with a CPA or, or, or bookkeeper or whoever, um, having a, a great way to, to transfer a lot of information um, quickly. I use also a share file which is a way of, um, um, you know, securely for those more confidential documents and stuff uh, transferring. But uh, I'm also a big fan of uh, QuickBooks Online. Um, um, uh, is that your question? I'm sorry. I kind of get, I see, see, I that, am a geek. I start talking about technology. It gets me all excited. No, that, that is, that is the question. I, and I, I knew that, you know, I, I gave you a, a lob there. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, I actually have a, that's a problem, I, my shiny my shiny object syndrome, I, I love to check out new uh, technologies and new uh, uh, new things like that, but anything that I can do, um, um, and I know you're the same way, to automate and to, to make it uh, uh, easily um, able to be delegated, I, I'm all for. In, pro, in the project management stuff, Basecamp, I've used a lot of different project management ones, and there's there's deficiencies in all of them. So you got to find out what what works best for you. But um, um, Basecamp, I, I'm it works perfectly for me. Now, a lot of people ask me, "Hey, Mark, how do you get away with you know not being a dealer? Because you're in the business of buying and selling raw land, so there's no capital gains treatment on your properties." And I make the argument that I can bifurcate between, in some deals, I'm a dealer, and in some deals, I'm an actual investor, um, and I do that. Now, to explain it legally, am I being too aggressive, or is this a gray area? Now, say that again. So, you're saying you, you can bifurcate being a dealer versus being an versus investor? Versus an investor. So, if I hold a property a year and a day, right? those properties I'm an, I'm an investor in. And when I flip properties before that, then I'm a dealer and I pay ordinary income versus paying ordinary income on all the deals I do. Well, I mean, your business, the way, the, the way your typical land business um, uh, is, is done in your situation, you're, you're, I would argue you're definitely a dealer, uh, even if you're holding it over, over a year. Um, 
it's because it's essentially inventory. I mean, it'd be like uh, if I made uh, you know a widget and it sat on the shelf for a year, that's still still inventory. Um, and then you know, there's there's really um, and I I don't know off the top of my head. I believe it's five properties uh, is the kind of the IRS rule that, and it's not really. There's no hard and fast rule. Basically, if it looks like and smells like you're a dealer, they're going to call you a dealer. But I think that the tax court has shown like this is. I believe it's five properties in a year. Um, that if you're in it in your business, you're obviously selling them as. Well, I shouldn't say obviously. There could be an instance that you would uh, maybe want to hold some but not the way you do land. In that case, I would likely put that in a different entity. Um, a different, maybe set up a different type of entity that you would have as an investment company and one that's uh, doing your, your land deals. So, I like that. Hey, Mark. So like when, when we did, uh, when I did accounting for land investors back in February, uh, that webinar thing, you know, we, we, we kind of talk about this a little bit. And there, there are guidelines. I mean, Jim, Jim's right. There's, there's guidelines to go on. And what's cool about, what's cool about the whole process is that uh, the, the IRS will actually look at every single property on a case by case basis. So just because you're a dealer on this set doesn't like, and Jim's saying it, like just because you're a dealer on land doesn't mean that you're a dealer on everything. And in fact, if you, if you were going to hold some things, uh, then, then you could easily be considered even on land, you could even be considered a non-dealer or an investor over there. It just depends on your marketing activities and your sales activities. Um, or, you know, like if you went and bought another class of, of real estate, that could be treated completely separate from the way that you do your land business. So it's pretty cool. I think a lot of people kind of get bogged down. Oh, I'm a dealer. But, but yes, you could be a dealer, but you could also be an investor. Right. It all depends. Right. And, and one of the biggest problems when I first started was I had the wrong CPA because I didn't start with your gym. And this CPA said, hey, Mark, you're a dealer. <laughs> and, like, and like a car dealer, you know, you might sell that property for $32,000 on terms. You have to take the whole $32,000 as if you sold it today, even though you're financing it over 15 years. And from a tax perspective, I got crushed, right? Then I found Jim. And he's like, no, they actually, you know, there's an exemption for raw land and the installment sale, you know, laws and here's the code and you only pay tax as you make money, which made life a lot better. Um, do you see that a lot, Jim, where people, you know, just don't even understand. I mean, the code's huge. No one, no one person can know everything. So how do people oh, no. get around it? Yeah, that's, I mean, there's no way to know it all. Uh, you just gotta know. And quite honestly, um, even, you can make the argument that even you have to be very knowledgeable about it, even to find it in the IRS code, because you have to know what terms to search for and things like that. It gets, gets very tricky. And, um, you know, the, in your situation, uh, the, the way that it, kind of going back to what Scott was saying, uh, the way the raw land was, was pretty cut and dry, but to, to his point, it, yeah, if, you, if you're doing raw land and at all, you're marketing it and selling it, uh, trying to, you know, turn it fast and you're, you're holding paper and it's all done, you know, approximately the same. Those are all, uh, de you know, regular deals. But then if you went and bought a strip mall or a, uh, a commercial building and you were going to hold it to lease or you were going to renovate it and then sell it, that's a different category altogether. Um, that can be uh, bifurc bifurcated and, and, and handled separately. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place. I'm like, I'm like the, uh, the, the one off accountant that has a uh, ADD um, and, and can't, can't keep my mind on anything. But going back to your, your point about the, the IRS code, it's, it's complex and, and you got to get advice for that kind of stuff because um, there's nothing worse than, than um, you know, finding out. Unfortunately, sometimes two, three years down the road, the IRS will decide to look at that, that return and, it's, you know, you've forgotten all the specifics behind it. So keep good records too. How do you keep good records? <laughs> uh, well, uh, book, bookkeeping, good bookkeeping is one thing. Um, me, you know, you know, I, people get caught up in, in carrying receipts and stuff like that. I'm a big fan of, of scanning all that stuff because if, 
I, I literally had a client that kept all their stuff in a, a, a warehouse and it got flooded and they lost everything. And um, um, we had to f like kind of figure out what their tax return was based off of uh, bank statements. And so I say scan the stuff, um, keep it, you don't have to produce it for your CPA, um, but you need to have it if you ever get audited. Um, and, and try to keep, if you keep on top of the bookkeeping, um, you know, I, I do it daily for my personal business, but if you keep on top of the bookkeeping regularly, it's really not that uh, overwhelming. If you let it build up, it can get uh, very, very overwhelming fast. Yeah. Deb is mad at me by the way, cause I've been letting it build up, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> 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 I, I will get to it. Yeah. It's in base camp. I, I was not, I was not going to take a personal jab at you, but uh. <laughs> no, I, I deserve it. I deserve it. So Scott Todd, how, how are you organizing and keep in, in keeping everything organized? So I use uh, I use zero, not QuickBooks online. It's very similar to QuickBooks online. I've got some integrations built in. That's why I chose it, but essentially all, everything goes into zero. Um, you know, what I, what I do is uh, I actually do the installment method of accounting on every single transaction. So when we buy the, when we, when we sell the note or sell the trans, uh, sell the piece of land, we actually record uh, something, you know, a journal entry, if you will, to, to uh, installment AR accounts receivable. We offset that with um, deferred gross profit. It's kind of, a, you know, installment method of accounting. So that way we, we look at our balance sheet and we know this is how much money we have in notes. Uh, this is how much money we have that's deferred gross profit for later on. We get our accurate financial statements and everything goes right into zero. I love daily, it. Daily, 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 daily. Jim Atkinson, what do you think? Think about what his, his process. I like zero too. Um, I, I will say uh, zero was kind of the, uh, the first good online software that was out there. The first time QuickBooks Online came out, it was complete crap. They have been playing catch up with Zero, and I would say it's it's comparable. Um, Zero. The only reason I don't use Zero, I think Zero is a lot, you know, from a aesthetic standpoint, it's a lot more uh, uh, nice piece of sauce, software. The, the reports are a lot nicer coming out. Um, and I just am used to QuickBooks because QuickBooks uh, is what anybody, any small business accountant is kind of raised with QuickBooks. Um, but I, I also support Zero too. Um, it's great software. I, uh, um, it don't, I just don't know it as well. So, so Jim, you know, when I go to the dentist, right, and they give me a crown, I leave the office. I don't know if they did a good job or not, unless I go to another dentist and ask them, hey, How's that crowd like? <laughs> right? So the same thing with a CPA, right? How the hell are we supposed to know if a CPA is good or not unless another CPA looks at the return and says, oh, this looks good, or I don't even know. Like, how would you recommend somebody going out and finding a competent CPA? Uh, it's complicated because um, everybody, I mean, so another CPA could take the work I do and probably find something that they would do differently. Not to say it's right or wrong, but I see the same thing. I see returns every day from new, new clients, new prospects, and I find, uh, you know, areas where, you know, it might make me uncomfortable to file a return with that to, and, you know, different things. Um, you know, you, my, my opinion is you want somebody that's, that's uh, you know, easy to talk to. You got to have some chemistry, uh, someone that's, that's committed to bringing you value as far as uh, tax saving strategies and, um, you know, somebody that <laughs> has been in business for a while. Check, uh, check the records too or the, with the, um, there's a difference. A lot of people don't know the difference between the different professionals too. There's a, there's CPAs, which, in the accounting profession, that's kind of the highest level. There's EAs, which is an enrolled agent, which are good, but that's H a certification. Yeah, HR the block. They're, they're like the C students in accounting. Oh. Right? Yeah. <laughs> H oh, Mark. HR block. Wait, wait, wait. 
Is there some personal dig here? No, no, no. It's come on. That's rough. Is that rough? Yeah, I think so. All right. Hey, they're the they're the B minus students. Okay, okay. Hey, well, I hey, look, hey, I think I think there's a um not that I know of any personal H and R blocks uh person, but I will tell you that I know like some some EAs or whatever. And there's a difference, you know, like Jim, Jim's saying, like, you know, he's Jim's a CPA and, and CPAs are great. Um, and then EAs, they, they serve a completely different function, right? A CPA is someone that can certify financials, whereas an EA is really just focused only on the taxes, right? Like it's, there's a, exactly. it's like, it's a difference in, you know, de- de- dentist, you know, one's, one can be more precise and one can be a generalist. No, I, I, and I would make the argument between like a brain surgeon, right? And and a general <laughs> practitioner. They both go to medical school, but when it comes to saving my life, I'd rather go to the brain surgeon. No? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be more expensive. But well, when, be- when, 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 it comes, when it comes to representing clients before the IRS, though, the only three people that can do it is an attorney, a CPA, and an enrolled agent, an EA. So those, uh, I, I, would, I would recommend that you, well, most attorneys, most tax attorneys aren't going to prepare tax returns. Um, they are, they're there to interpret law and to deal um, with, you know, most of the time they're dealing with estate planning and complicated stuff like that. For tax prep, I would highly recommend a CPA or an, an enrolled agent. But quite honestly, um, like, like Scott was saying, CPAs, uh, there's some CPAs that never touch a tax return their whole life. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That's true. So Scott, I, I apologize to the C student enrolled agent. <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, I don't want to alienate our audience here. I, I do. It's but, okay. You know. It's okay, right? <laughs> Look, if you go back to episode number one, we said that. We said we were going to alienate the audience. So, and No, we, it's not that we're going to alienate the audience because we don't have an audience of enrolled agents. What we're, I, but I think it's, it's important that, you know, there is a distinction between your enrolled agent and your CPA. I'm sorry. It's just true. It's okay. It's okay. It's all good, right? Mark. All right. So, what's the third? There are also pairs out there. Pairs. Wait, Jim, I'm losing you there. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, just uh, there are some preparers out there that don't have uh, an EA, a CPA, or a law designation. That some of them are good, but you're 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 rolling the dice. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I I feel quite comfortable telling the listeners don't roll the dice yeah and, and get a, and get a cpa unless you have a very simple return save the money and go to an enrolled agent absolutely a cpa will cost more money right but in our business it's a little bit it's a complicated return scott Todd. agreed yeah you got a separate schedules for for every single property you sell scott why is that why 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 do i have to do that uh, you have to have a separate form for every installment sale because uh, they want the specific information for every property sold. So Mark's return, I charge him by the pound. Well, you yeah, have to give I, me a I always deal. win thickest return in the office, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> He's like the day trader clients I have uh, that show up with a statement that's like a foot thick. Yeah, it's, lovely. It's, it's all good fun. This is what you have to look forward to, Scott. I know I'm, I'm there now. Yeah. Jim, Jim and I, Jim and I are going to have to meet cause like I'm in Tampa. I'm just going to have to drive over and see him. Oh, I didn't know you in Tampa. Yeah. I'm, I'm close by. I used to live in Orlando actually. I used to live not too far from where you are now. Okay. So. Awesome. Yeah. I'm right by, I can see Lake Eola from my office. So yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So, well, Jim, we're at that point in the podcast, your mentorship this, you know, during this podcast has been fantastic, but we're going to ask you, for one more tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? So I, I've just started the book, so I can't speak to how great it is, but I've heard great things about it. And I just started, I know you're a reader as well. Uh, so this might be one for you. Um, but, uh, you know, we're all all distracted these days with everything. Um, I'm reading. My sister bought me Deep Work. I can't I, remember. Jim, I've been talking about that pod, that book for like months now. It's my favorite book. It changed my life. Uh, really? Changed my life. Honestly, I check email now twice a day. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. That's yeah. So I just started it and um, am uh, looking. Uh, you can tell I, I've been so behind. I have your podcast. I still listen to it, um, but I haven't. I haven't listened to any podcast here lately. I've been listening to books, but um, I've got this one actually in, uh, to read. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm hoping it'll change my life too. No, this book is so good. And just a little brain hack that I would do that he, he mentioned was commencing shutdown. Giving your brain permission to shut down has been invaluable. Just, just that alone. And I've, I, Scott, I've, I'm, do I look calmer, less distracted? More yeah, you, you do. And, you know, like I'm, I'm in the same exact boat as Jim. I've got the book and started listening to it. And, you know, uh, in, the, in the intro, he makes, a very good, makes some very good points. I'm not, I haven't gone deep into the book to... Like you. <laughs> Maybe I can, right. be cool, I can be calm like you. Maybe Jim and I are going to, like, get this book done together and we'll both be like calm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I was an addict. I mean, I'd be checking email every 10 seconds, like a do, like a dopamine fiend. Now I'm, 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 you know, I'm still scared like any actor would be, but uh, I, it's been a good seven weeks of sobriety since deep work. Well, you know, I actually did the, um, I stole it from uh, Tim Ferriss and, and uh, I saw it, I, I was reminded of it from uh, an email I got this week. I actually put an email uh, autoresponder on now that says, basically, I check email once a day and uh, it, it's basically going to be 24 hours before I get in touch with you if you need anything urgently to call. <laughs> So, because I, I, this time of year is just, I'm bombarded with emails. It's, it's impossible to stay up. So, yeah. And, and I haven't even emailed you. I know. <laughs> that's right. I mean, oh, but a lot of that's just out of shame for being so far behind. Now, <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, Tom, what's your tip of the week? All right, Mark, this is one that you can use and Jim can use it too. Maybe Jim or I uses it. I don't know. But right. I just did this last night. I'm so excited. I had to share with the with everybody. There's this little company called Shipt, S-H-I-P-T. They will go, you can download an app. You download the app, you put in your information, you create an account. They will allow you to order things from your local grocery store. They will bring it to you. I mean, like this was the greatest thing ever because I didn't want to go to the store. My wife didn't want to go to the store yesterday. We had things going on. So what do we do? We download the app. We chose the items that we wanted. Uh, they basically said, when do you want it? We said, Hey, we'd like it between four and five, uh, yesterday. No problem. It showed up at like four thirty. You can't get any better than that. And <laughs> it was just easy. Now, most precious asset. What is it? It's, it's time, right? Time. Who wants to stand in line at the grocery store? Not me. They stood in line at the deli for me. It's the greatest thing ever. It's great. It, it's, it's so brilliant. I, Check I, it out. I love it. I, I downloaded the app as soon as it, it told me. Jim Atkins, your life's going to change here. Shipped. Yeah, he can. Yeah, that's a. The, 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 I, I, we've been doing here lately. Uh, I would never go into Walmart to shop. No offense to Walmart, but it's just, uh, you know, those pictures they send around the, the internet are, are true. Uh, but they have the Walmart, uh, not delivery, but the Walmart pickup now where you go and order and you pick it up. You just pull up and they load your car up. It's like great too. But shipped, um, I, I just. I had heard of it and I saw somebody at Publix the other day with a shirt, a shipped shirt on, uh, walking around, picking, filling a cart up. I was like, ah, I need to try that out. Yeah. Two, two weeks. They'll give you two weeks for free to try it out. Plus $15 off your first grocery store visit. I mean, I'm saving money to the, to like, I'm telling you, Mark, I told you on a podcast, I don't know, some episodes ago, I was thinking about run for, for uh, the local office to make them the internet great again. Look, I'm helping everybody, everybody <laughs> working. Go do this. Yeah, and so true. I mean, we can always make more money. We can't get more time. Uh, speaking of making more money and protecting that money and making sure that it doesn't go to your favorite uncle, Sam, check out AtkinsonCPA.com. That is my tip of the week. Now, be warned that if Jim gets too busy to take my phone calls, you know, those of you that contact him, we're going to have a problem. But do me a favor. Favor. And, you know, after you listen to this podcast, if you want to learn more about Jim, um, you know, go to AtkinsonCPA.com and mention the Land Geek, you know, referred you. And I'm sure Jim might give you like 50 or 75 cents off, you know, something like that. <laughs> I can work that, that, was, that was percent, right? 50 to 75% off, Mark? 
No, no, no. That was cents. Per, percent. Oh, no, no, no. Per. All of a sudden, I'm losing audio here. <laughs> yeah, see, now, now it's just like... 75%. You're right, down. right. 75%. Thanks, yeah, Mark. Just like I'm, I'm a trifle deaf in my, in my right ear. The Willy Wonka 75% thing. of a million dollars. There you go. There you go. No, I'm just kidding. Look, you, you know, I, 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 you know, I think that when it comes to good advice, you got to pay for it, honestly. Um, you know, you can, you can certainly save money by getting, you know, a C minus student at H and R block. <laughs> but I think ultimately, you know, you're going to pay a lot more in taxes. So you got to pick your poison. Anyways, you're going to pay one day. You're going to pay. We're all going to pay. All right. AtkinsonCPA.com. I have a, a link to uh, his site. Um, I want to thank all the listeners. And look, the only way we're going to get my own personal CPA to come on this podcast is if you do us three little favors. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. I do want to remind everybody today's podcast was sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek jim atkinson are we good it's it's amazing i even got you during tax season no this is good we've been trying to do this uh for a while it seemed like something always came up so it was uh fun to fun to do this this is great well i really appreciate it and uh i'll you know i'll get everything to deb so i'll, I'll let you get back to deep work so uh i won't, I won't bother you uh, scott are we good mark we're great all right. Should we, should we do it for Jim? Come on. We got to. All right. Ready? One, two, two three. three. Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. That's good. <laughs> oh, no. Good stuff. It's good stuff. Jim just fired me as a client. He's like, he's <laughs> like, he's like, I, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll work with geeks, but not that geeky. If everybody could just see the no, video of how we pull this off, you know, the, the let freedom ring thing, I think everybody would have a great appreciation for what we did. I think they would. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully there's no video. Yeah, no. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody and uh, we'll see you everybody next time. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Bye.